done. Uh, so today we're talking about the science of microwaving your coffee. Let's jump straight in. For the longest time, there's been a lot of preconceptions, preconceived notions about microwaving coffee. There's been uh, understandings that microwaves can cause cancer. There's been understandings that it's going to cause your coffee to become really bitter. Don't microwave your coffee. It's the worst. And it's be there's just this whole mythology behind it. But where... Does that mythology, where is that, what, what's, it, what's it rooted in? Where, from where does it come? From what does it stem? Now, in order to prepare for this video, I consulted a few uh, articles that I found. Uh, Dr. Samo Smirke and Dr. Christopher Hinden both contributed to independently two different articles. And then I also talked to them independently outside of those to get their, uh, to get their understandings of what that means, reheating your coffee, microwaving your coffee. Is it actually that bad? Because here's the deal, a lot of us, myself included, might have kids or we have dogs or we have uh, other preoccupations, ADHD, whatever it might be, and we forget that we've brewed a delicious cup of coffee. And then when we remember, the cup's cold as crap and we don't really want to drink it anymore. It's like, oh, what the heck? Then you end up brewing another one or whatever. Now, there are some people who might want to toss in the microwave, and they do, but then others shame them. Why, do you, why are you putting in the microwave? What are you thinking? That's awful. You're going to get cancer and die, probably. No, no, no. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take an objective scientific approach to these, and we're going to actually take a look into these questions from uh, the perspective of a couple of chemists. So. First of all, let's just talk about what a microwave is. Like, what the heck is this contraption? What, what is this contraption? What does it do? Well, very simply put, it uses electromagnetic radiation using microwaves in order to heat up food. Now, the way that this happens is it's shooting these wavelengths that are typically around 2.45 gigahertz around there in a microwave oven, uh, which can be about 12.25 centimeters in length, the wavelengths. And what it's doing is it's shooting it back and forth inside the microwave. It's bouncing off all of the walls in a very predictable manner coming out of a, are you ready for this word? Out of a magnetron. That's really what it's called, okay? It's freaking sick. All right, so it's coming out of a magnetron, these electromagnetic waves, which literally means there's it's electric and it has magnets and there's, the, there's a magnet inside of it, yada, yada, yada. We won't get too far into it, but essentially we're shooting out electromagnetic waves. They're bouncing off the metal on the interior. Now you might be asking, well, if these waves are coming out, how are they not getting to me? If it can travel through obviously a glass bowl, why can't it travel? through the front right there. Well, there's this little lattice method, these holes on the front, which we'll get a little close up of, but these holes on the front and they're small enough that they won't allow the waves to come through and they're big enough so that you can see your food actually cooking. Now, there is no worry at all. I'm gonna go ahead and put the myth to rest. There's no such thing as getting cancer from microwaves. They do not have enough Power. They cannot ionize. They cannot do what ultraviolet rays and x-rays can do. Microwaves are little babies. They're little babies, okay? They're completely safe. You can sit around, microwave all you want. It's not going to come out of the microwave. It's not going to get you. I feel like I'm talking like Jack Black from School of Rock. Um, not going to call your parents. Um, anyway, so... That's what's going on. And so what they do is they begin to make the, the frequency is like in sync with the water molecules in, in the foods or whatever you're putting inside the microwave. And so since water molecules, H2O, you have two hydrogens and the oxygen down here, because it's a polar uh, molecule, what happens is the polarity, the positive end is trying to get in line with the, the microwaves, the frequencies. So it's going down and up, down and up as the frequency is going across and bouncing and bouncing and going all over in this crazy way. So that water molecule keeps moving down, up, down, up, down, up, and that movement causes this vibration that is giving it energy. So essentially, the way a microwave works is a magnetron is shooting on electromagnetic waves. These waves are in a certain frequency that is jiving with the hydrogen, uh, the uh, dihydrogen oxide, the H2O molecules, and those are going up and down, headbanging it, headbanging it, getting some energy like you're in a mosh pit getting that energy and it's heating up those molecules. Now in food, 
the way that the food is being heated up, because you're like, whoa, 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 how is all my food getting heated up? It's because it's kind of dissipating out. The heat is dissipating to the areas around it. So the, the, all the food is going to get hot because those water molecules are getting really hot from the, all the excitement, all the energy, and then it kind of dissipates out. So microwaving is an extremely efficient and quick method in order to heat something up. Now, whenever we're talking about reheating coffee, my coffee currently is getting really cold. What we're, the reason that people have this, um, this horrible experience with the microwave it, it, it is, is, is there's a lot of different reasons why. First off, if you heat it up too far, then you can obviously begin to get into this zone where chemical reactions are happening. But Dr. Chris Hendon, he, is, he surmises that if you're heating it just about 60, 65 Celsius or about 130, 140 Fahrenheit, which is kind of the ideal drinking temperature so that you can uh, ex uh, um, uh, appreciate throughout the, the lowering of the temperature, all of the acidity and the sweetness that the coffee has to offer. If you're just heating it up that far in about you know 30 seconds or so, you don't really have enough time for these chemical uh, these chemical reactions to occur. You might have uh, you might have enough energy in the system in order to do it, but that doesn't mean that the molecules in there are at a critical uh, con concentration where they could do that. And, and there may be some interaction between molecule A, molecule B, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's th that any uh, there, that there's any time for anything to really happen. So if you're just heating up to that 60, 65 degrees Celsius drinking temperature, you're likely not going to have any chemical composition. I I've been reading some articles that have been floating around of coffee people who talk about quinic and chlorogenic acids and how these uh, show up more when you heat coffee and that explains the bitterness blah 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 but the fact of the matter is there's no real evidence backing that up there's no real you know, and so what we have is we have these two chemists who have put out these articles, which are obviously linked in the caption below. And before I continue, I'm going to ask that you hit the subscribe and the like, because I always do this at the end and no one watches the end of my videos. So I'm going to do it now and hopefully I, you know, we get some, we get some of you on board. Anyway, let's continue. So what you have is these two chemists that they're saying that the most efficient way to reheat your coffee is to microwave it. Now, what Dr. Smirke talks about is that what is going on as a coffee is cooling is you're losing volatile aromatics. Now, these volatiles are what are really contributing to the, to the full range of flavor in your cup of coffee. So even as it's sitting and cooling, you're losing volatile aromatics. When you reheat it, you're gonna lose even more volatile aromatics. Now, that being said, Obviously, when you heat it, because you're going to cause more of the um, um, discontinuity and the equilibrium, and you're going to have more going on. Even when water's at room temperature, you have minor evaporation, but it's it's very, very, very minute. But obviously, the higher you bring the temp up, the more that's going to happen, the more aroma is going to escape. But a good point he brought up is when you have really cold coffee, if it's a highly aromatic coffee, you're going to experience a lot less of that aroma when it's cold because your olfactories cannot detect it when liquid is cold. So he actually argues that with really aromatic coffees, if you just pop in the microwave for a bit, you'll actually experience more aroma. So you'll have a better experience heating it up. So there, there's, there's a big push for people saying, don't reheat your coffee, just dump some ice in it, enjoy it as is. Don't reheat your coffee, just brew a new cup. I take the more sustainable approach that aligns with these two chemists of don't, don't, don't worry. If your coffee gets cold, toss in the microwave and heat it only to drinking temperature. Don't overheat it. Now, it is important to note that people have said, oh, the caffeine might break down. Dr. Hendon points out that caffeine is quite inert. It's very stable. And so he says, even if you, you would have to heat it essentially to 350 degrees Fahrenheit in order for any reaction to occur to lose or break down the caffeine. And that would only occur at evaporation, hence it's 350 degree number and you're not doing that in a microwave you're not going to just yeet that temp way up high instead you need to just heat it in little increments in order to hit your target temperature now I've also read a lot of people about like, you know, take it in 10 seconds and stir, 10 seconds stir. But something else that Dr. Hennon was telling me is stirring can actually catalyze some of these reactions. So whereas we're not 100% sure reactions can even occur in such a small amount of time, sitting and stirring and heating and stirring and allowing more and more of that exposure it just increases the odds of that happening. So what he and Smirke both suggest doing is to use the microwave expediently. Put your, you put your cup in and get used to the volumes to where it heats up at certain 
certain uh, to, to certain degree so that you know exactly how much time to put in based off the volume in your cup. And then you'll have a more aromatic, even though you've lost some, you'll reintroduce uh, the the capability of those volatile aromatics to be received by your olfactories. You'll, you'll be able to do that and you'll also be able to enjoy your warm cup of coffee. Now, to combat the the accusations of a more bitter cup, I'm sure there is a, th th those those claims are warranted. I'm not arguing that, but it's probably because as coffee cools, you get more of the sweet and, uh, and and acidic flavors that come out. That's why, like in Brewers Cup competition, we really want judges to taste mostly as it's cold. That's like where it tastes the best. And in barista competition, you have people using frozen spoons to cool the, the espresso down rapidly because that's where the most interesting, uh, perceptible flavors are. Not necessarily uh, that there are more acids or there's some sort of comp uh, uh, chemical degradation going on that allows for something to come out, but more so our perception of those flavors are tip tend to be at their highest around 120, 140 Fahrenheit or around 50, 60 Celsius. So what you have is this push to have these drinks be at a more drinkable temperature for judges so that they can exp experience a wider range of these flavors. Well, same thing happens here. As the coffee cools down, you're experiencing more and more of that sweetness and acidity because it's more perceptible. Then when you heat it back up, it becomes less perceptible once again because of the higher temperature. And of course, now you do have less of the volatile aromatics by nature of the coffee having cooled down the first time around. So you're not doing anything negative. There's nothing really proving you're doing something Something negative. Could there be chemical reactions going on? Perhaps, but it would be at a really small level and probably not even discernible by our palates. Are volatile aromatics escaping? Of course they are, but the same thing happens as a cup of coffee sits. Yes, you might catalyze some of them to escape even faster, but if you have a highly aromatic coffee, the likelihood is you're going to experience more of them by rejuvenating them through heating it. So yeah, you could dump ice into your coffee and have a cold brew, but you're not really going to get much at all of those nice aromatics that the coffee is presenting you that you first brew. So, be sustainable. If your cup of coffee gets cold because you're chasing little squirts around or you're, you go outside and you're talking to your neighbor or you're on the phone or you're like me, you just, I don't know, you're just doing something and you forget. Don't toss it out. Don't brew a new one. Don't, you know, throw ice in it. Instead, toss in the microwave. 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Figure it out for what your volume is, for what your your cup material is, and have kind of an idea of what you should do. Once it's out, give it a little stir, give it a drink, you'll be much happier. And uh, just remember, don't overheat. Now, often there are recommendations to just use a thermos or something like the Ember mug, which are absolutely great, but that's not really what we're talking about here, right? We're talking more so about coffee that's gone cold. Of course, using a thermos to elongate the heat of a coffee is great. That's a great thing to do. Or using the Ember mug to maintain a temperature. I love Ember mugs. So those are fantastic alternatives in order to maintain the heat. I don't enjoy drinking from a thermos personally. I'm very um, tactile. This actually isn't even the cup I like drinking from. It's just because it's glass so you can kind of see through it. It's just a little Ikea one. I like to have some sort of ceramic in my hands because that's a huge part of the drinking process for me. So I would rather it get cold and reheat and enjoy the vessel I'm using than to use something like a thermos. Especially metal thermoses, I always get some sort of metallic-y taste that I don't enjoy. Ceramic thermoses, I haven't really really enjoyed just yet. Um, I do like the Ember mug that you can keep it at a certain temperature. Uh, I, I, I tend to set it at the lowest temperature just so if I forget it, it's there and then I'll turn it off as I'm drinking it because I do like to experience coffee as it cools all the way down. Now in air pots or in carafes when you're at a coffee shop, there is a certain time limit you must kind of observe with coffees inside of those. The longer coffee sits in there, you are going to encourage those reactions because it's maintaining a super high temperature. So in the same way that reheat much too high or reheating too hot or reheating for too long can encourage those reactions. Same thing happens in a thermos or in a or something else. You can't just keep coffee hot for a long period of time. There will be reactions. Like I said with the microwave, the reason it's so good and efficient is because how quick it is. It's boom, it's heated up, you're ready to go. You don't give the the compounds inside enough time to really react. Like I said, there's not really a critical point at which these are wanting to react. So you'd really have to be pushing the time and the temperature in order for something to occur to degrade the chemical, the composition of the chemicals and the molecules and whatnot inside the coffee itself. Same thing with a the thermos. If it sits at a certain temperature or a carafe or an air pot at a cafe, if it's sitting at that really high temperature for a prolonged period of time, you are essentially begging for it to oxidize and to go undergo some sort of changes. So I highly recommend at cafes to never have coffee in an air pot beyond 60 to 90 minutes. Switch them out frequently because even if it's still hot, there are changes that are happening. And the, because 
because it's trapped, those volatile aromatics can't escape. There's weird things going on inside of it. So with a thermos, with an air pot, with all these different things, there is still a time limit on them. So you need to be cognizant of that. A thermos is a great thing if you are wanting to uh, not have to reheat your coffee and drink it over an hour or an hour and a half. I, even if you have something like a Yeti that can maintain the temperature all day, I still would not recommend it because it'll be pretty gross. I would rather just the coffee get cold, it kind of gets stable once it's cold, than reheat it, okay? so. That's my little aside on thermoses, on ember mugs and things like that. Those are great and I recommend doing that over this. Just know that there's still a time limit for tasty coffee. You, you stretch out the capability of drinking that coffee without having to reheat, but in the end, there is still a time limit on it. So you're not out of the clear if you're using one of those. So um, for this video, this was a quick one. I, I want to thank the work that Dr. Hen and Dr. Smirke have done. Again, their articles are linked below where they talk about this. But the long and short of it is, reheating coffee is never the best thing in the world because you're going to lose something. But it is better than being uns unsustainable and having to just brew a new pot of coffee. It's better than tossing ice in and just completely butchering your coffee. And it's really better than any of the alternatives. So if you need to reheat your coffee, don't use a stove. This is one more point I forgot to bring up. There have been people in some of these articles I've read arguing you should use a stove and slowly heat it up. No, the slower you heat it up, the more volatiles you're going to allow to escape. The slower you heat it up, the more time you're giving reactions to occur. The slower you heat it up, and if you're stirring it or whatever, the more susceptible that solution is to having some sort of chemical reaction and is going to change the flavors inherent uh, that are inherent to the coffee itself. So putting it on a stovetop and doing slowly, putting it on a steam wand, using uh, any of these other types of burners, um, th th that's just not the way to go, okay? The best way from scientists to reheat your coffee is yeeting that in a microwave and letting it go ding, and then you'll be able to enjoy with your old factories the tasty tasty of a no wasty coffee. Oh, well, friends, I hope you enjoyed today's video. For a little change of pace, I invite you to check out my Patreon below. You know, make sure you hit the like, the subscribe. Make sure you check out some of the videos I'll have linked up here at the end. I think you'll dig them. Maybe you won't. And if you don't, that's cool too. But in the end, I just hope that you all brew a tasty cup. And guess what? If that tasty cup gets cold, just throw in the microwave for a little bit. Have some fun with it. Yeah. So I hope you all have a wonderful day and cheers.